Ladies and gentlemen, please take this opportunity to silence your cellular devices. First Presbyterian Church of Arlington Heights, in partnership with Chicago Theological Seminary, would like to welcome you to a conversation with Reza Aslan on Islamic Reformation. Please welcome pastor of First Presbyterian Church and our host and moderator for the evening, Alex Lang, and our very special guest speaker, Reza Aslan. Thank you. I want to welcome you all here this evening. Thank you for coming out tonight. <coughs> Every year, First Presbyterian Church of Arlington Heights, we try to bring important figures to our church so that we can talk about important issues that we are facing in our world today. And we are thrilled and feel so honored that Dr. Reza Aslan is here with us tonight. Dr. Aslan is a James Joyce Award winner, and he is an internationally renowned religion scholar. He is also, as you probably are well aware, the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth, and the international bestseller, No God But God. Tonight, we are coming together as a result of his relationship with Chicago Theological Seminary. He's a trustee there, and we want to say thank you to CTS for making this evening possible, for having this conversation. And I want to go through a little bit of what this evening is going to be like. So we're going to begin our conversation between Reza and myself. And then we, after we've established a, a, a grounding for the Islamic Reformation, uh, then we're going to open it up to you all. And so I know you all have come with your questions, uh, with things that you want to ask. And we hope that you will. And so the way it'll work is when you come up to ask your question, we would ask that you ask one question when you come, because there's probably a lot of people. And I know that he wants to answer uh, all of the questions of people who've come here. We ask you that you ask ones. And you're probably thinking, oh, I'll just ask it in several parts as I go down, right? <laughs> so just keep it as succinct as possible. And if we have time at the end, then uh, you can come up and you can ask another question later. Following our conversation tonight, uh, there will be a reception out in the narthex where you came in. And it's during that time that Dr. Aslan is going to be signing books. And if you haven't uh, brought your books with you, I know a number of you already have books. If you didn't bring your copies with you, you can purchase books um, and you uh, can get them signed. I can tell you right now, if you've never read his books, they, you're in for a real treat because he really combines uh, scholarship and narrative storytelling in an amazing way. And I can tell you that as a Christian pastor who studied at Princeton, there's a lot that I know about Christian history, and his book, Zealot, opened my mind about the way that I look at Jesus, and I'm so thankful that he took the time to write that book. Now, I'm sure you're tired of hearing me talk, so I think we should get to our conversation for the evening. Would you agree? All right, <laughs> Thanks, let's Alex. do that. <laughs> Thank you. What a warm welcome. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm excited. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Yeah, yeah I'm really glad that you could make it, yeah. make it out. So I was wondering, for those, of, for those here who don't really know about your background, where you're from, can you talk a little bit about where you grew up sure. uh, and maybe tell us a little bit about your family and even your religious background? Uh, I was born in Iran. Uh, uh, I am an immigrant. Uh, I'm here to steal all your jobs, uh, all, all the all the religion jobs that you won't do. <laughs> um, uh, my family came. I, you know, we were sort of a you know culturally Muslim family, the way so many people are culturally religious. My father, however, um, was a uh, kind of a firebrand communist, very anti-religious. Uh, um, proud atheist, annoying atheist, uh, the kind of atheist who always had a pocket full of Prophet Muhammad jokes that he would pull out at inappropriate times, you know, like that yeah. kind of atheist. Um, and uh, 
I, actually, it was kind of fortunate for us because when the revolution happened in Iran in 1979, uh, Iran had a, a massive popular revolution to bring down um, the, uh, the monarchy. And um, when the Ayatollah Khomeini came back to Iran and, and said that you know, he, he had no interest in any kind of political role for himself, he just wanted to be left alone, my father, who never trusted anyone wearing a turban, uh, thought, you know, I just just to be on the safe side, let's leave until things settle down a little bit. Um, and uh, and it, he turned out to be right. I mean, um, Khomeini ended up taking over the, the country and it became the Islamic Republic that it is now. And, uh, and I grew up mostly in the Bay Area um, of California. Uh, this was the 1980s, so it was during the, the height of the Iran hostage crisis. Mm -hmm. It was not the best time in the world to be uh, Iranian or Muslim. Did you, do, did you deal with any prejudice as a result? Oh yeah, of it was uh, all the time. There were, there were protests out on our streets. My, uh, uh, the bank wouldn't cash my father's uh, paychecks because he was Iranian. Uh, I would go to school and, and kids were wearing Bomb Iran t-shirts. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, I mean, you know, it, like I say, it, was, it wasn't the best time to be, to be Muslim, as opposed to now, when it's great. But back then, <laughs> back then it, wasn't, it, wasn't so, it wasn't so good. For like a seven-year-old kid, that's the thing, is that you know, when, you're, when you're seven years old, eight years old, and, and you're constantly being told that your identity, your culture, your religion is, is the enemy, um, you agree. And for us, when we came to the States, this was kind of, at least for my father, an opportunity to scrub our lives of Islam altogether. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he never, he, he, he was so tired of pretending to be Muslim in Iran anyway, and he thought, well, one good thing is now we don't have to pretend anymore. Um, and so I grew up in a very sort of non-religious family. My mom still prayed every once in a while, but for the most part, um, you know, we, we really scrubbed our lives of Islam. As I've admitted many times, I, I spent a good part of the 1980s pretending to be Mexican. Just told everybody, which tells you how little I understood America. <laughs> right. It did not help at all. Um, and then, you know, I think it was probably, I sometimes think that it may have been the effects of, the, of revolutionary Iran, the, the uh, experience of seeing that the power that religion has to transform a society, for good and for bad, um, which just created this lifelong interest in me, um, uh, an interest in religion and in religious history, religious figures, religious phenomenology, spirituality. Though, as I say, I never really had an opportunity to express that in any meaningful way until high school. Mm -hmm. uh, in high school, I started going to Young Life. <laughs> young Life? Young Life? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Young Life in the back, <laughs> represent. Um, uh, Young Life, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with it, it's, it's a non-denominational, but non-denominational is now a denomination. So right. it's basically a, you know, a, a Protestant evangelical uh, youth group. And uh, I went to a Young Life camp and I heard the gospel story for the first time. This incredible story about the God of heaven and earth coming down in the form of a baby, dying for our sins, this, the promise that anyone who believes in him um, shall also never die but have eternal life. I had never heard anything like that before in my life. So with your dad being an atheist, did you all talk about afterlife at all? Or was that Ooh. even a thing? That no, a we, thing? Did, we didn't talk about it. In fact, after I converted to Christianity, and a, and a particularly conservative evangelical brand of Christianity, um, my dad freaked out. He was just like, you know, why, we came here to, to escape religion. This is the last thing that I wanted, but um, but you know, I mean, it, it made me a really good boy. Like I would come home and like I wouldn't drink and I did everything. So it was like, maybe this, this will work, this is fine. I can like take advantage of, of this. Um, but I did have a problem. I mean, I, you know, I, I've never been the kind of person to just um, take what people tell me at face value. And so I would um, go to church or I would go to, you know, Bible study and, and um, I would hear the, the, the leader or the pastor say something or tell me something that the Bible says. And then I would check. <laughs> I would do that thing that we rarely do. Like, I mean, I'm just gonna see, make sure that that's actually what it says. 
And you know what I, what I kept discovering is that, well, sometimes it doesn't say that, or sometimes there's context behind it. Um, and then I would bring these questions to, to my group, uh, assuming that it would spur conversation. It did not spur a conversation, <laughs> uh, <laughs> on the contrary. Um, but it just it made me really interested and excited about um, the, the study of religion. And so when I went to college, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And so I, I, I started studying religion in a more formal um, setting. More specifically, I started studying the New Testament. Um, and it didn't take long for me to kind of realize that a lot of what I thought I knew was incomplete, uh, if not just downright incorrect. And, uh, and then also the other thing too is I started learning about um, religion in general, right? Not just a religion, but what religion is, how religion functions, how to, how to think about religion in its historical aspect. And, um, and how to understand it as, as you know, fundamentally a language, a, a, a means through which uh, a, an individual in a community can uh, express what is fundamentally inexpressible, right? This, mm. this ineffable experience of the divine. Um, and the more I started studying about it, the more I realized that the particular language that I had adopted, the language of Protestant evangelical Christianity, uh, wasn't doing it for me, and that I needed a new language. And then, in one of these crazy sort of you know twists of fate, I went to a, a, a Catholic Jesuit college, um, and the priests there. If you know Jesuits, this makes a lot of sense to you. The priests there were like, "Why not go back to Islam?" <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, Father." Um, and no, but that that really was. They they encouraged me. They said, "Look, you're clearly." You're clearly still searching for something here. Why not, why not look at the, the faith of your forefathers? And I didn't know anything about Islam. I literally knew nothing about Islam at that point. And so I started reading up on it and, and um, studying it. And the best way that I can put it, I don't know if this will make sense, but what I discovered was it, it was what I already believed. I just didn't mm -hmm. know that there was a language for it. <laughs> and. So I often say that I had a, 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 an emotional conversion to Christianity, and then I had an intellectual conversion to Islam. Ah. And here I am now. And here you are now. <laughs> Were you always, I mean, you're speaking of languages. I mean, it's clear to me from reading your books that you have a real grasp of the original languages in which these sacred s scriptures were written. Was that something that came easy to you, or was that something you had to really work out? No, I'm time? terrible at languages. <laughs> and it's terrible, because the study of religion is all about primary languages. Uh, and I'm really awful at it. My <laughs> wife is amazing. She can just pick up a language like that. Um, and I cannot. It, it was a real struggle for me. But I'm so glad you brought that up, because you know, in academia, we talk about it a lot, the importance of, of understanding you know, primary languages, to, of, of reading, for instance, the New Testament, uh, not in English, but in Greek. Uh, and and it's, it is extraordinarily important, because what we have to understand is that the minute you translate something, you are interpreting it, especially when you talk about these languages like Greek or Hebrew or Arabic, which are so variable. Um, where words have so many different meanings, denotations and connotations. And so somebody who translates it into English has already decided for you what that word means. Um, and it profoundly affects the way that you read and interpret the scripture. And if you are you know, somebody who is pious and devout and who truly believes that this is God-breathed scripture, um, then you should figure out how to get to its source uh, if you really want to understand it. Yeah, primary languages are, are extraordinarily important. Well, I have a quote I want to go from uh, No God But God, so I'm going to read this quote. and It'll be up on the screens for you all to read because I like this quote. This is, um, this is what he says. Religion has always been more than a matter of beliefs and practices. It is, above all, a perspective, a mode of being. Religion encompasses one's culture, one's politics, 
one's very view of the world. This is particularly true of Islam, which, like all great religions, has been shaped not only by metaphysical concerns, but also by the social, cultural, spiritual, and political milieu in which it finds itself. And so I was wondering, since we're going to get into Islamic Reformation, can you expand on how that quote in particular can give us some insight into how Islam has been shaped by those forces over the last century? Yeah, thank you for that. It's, it's funny. Um, this is, I think, one of the, the more uh, counterintuitive things that I talk about a lot, that religion is far more a matter of identity than it is a matter of beliefs and practices. That of course beliefs and practices are important, um, but they are secondary to the identity statement that religion is. When someone raises their hand and says, I'm Muslim, I'm Christian, I'm Jewish, I'm Hindu, they are making an identity statement, not a belief statement. Um, the best way that I can sort of demonstrate this for you is by pointing to the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, which says that 71% of Americans are Christian. 71%. <laughs> like really, really, seven out of 10 Americans, seven out of 10 Americans go to church on a regular basis, seven out of 10 Americans read the Bible, Seven out of 10 Americans can tell you anything about Jesus except that he was born in a manger and died on a cross? Right. Of course not. You know that that's not true. In your bones, you know that's not true. When that 70% says, I am Christian on that form, they're not saying, these are my beliefs. They're saying, this is my identity. This is who I am. And that's true everywhere in the world. When I said that we grew up Muslim, that's what I meant. I, don't know, I guess a, once in a while we went to mosque, but if you asked us, are we Muslim, we would say yes, because it's about who we are as human beings, how we understand ourselves, how we view our relationship to the world around us. And so as a matter of identity, going back to, to the quote, as a matter of identity, your religion is obviously wrapped up in all the other markers of your identity, be it your politics or your social status or your gender or your sexuality, whatever the case may be. Um, when you say, I am Christian, all of those things are wrapped up in it. Uh, your nationality, mm -hmm. your race, uh, your ethnicity, your culture. In fact, I would venture to guess that a great, great many of that 70%, when they mark, I am Christian, what they mean is, I am American. Mm -hmm. That's what they really mean. Um, and so I think that this creates some very important um, perspectives for thinking about not just Islam, but all religious traditions. For instance, I know that we talk a lot about getting religion out of politics, right? We hear that a lot, um, you know, that we should remove religion from politics. And, and I get that and I understand it. I also recognize that it's not actually possible because if religion is a matter of identity, then of course it's going to affect your politics. It should affect your politics. To say that you could just simply divorce your religion, which is who you are, not just your morals and your values, but who you are from your uh, political role in life, uh, especially in a democracy, just doesn't make any sense. Does it cause bad things? Yes, a lot. <laughs> uh, no more or less than religion in general does. Um, the reason that I think that that, that quote was you know, seen as so re revelatory is because we tend to think of Islam as somehow different, mm. right? Everyone in this room would say, well, of course Christianity has changed throughout the centuries. Of course it's incredibly diverse. Of course a Christian in Guatemala has a different view of Jesus than a Christian in suburban Chicago does. Of course, like, it, that's obvious. Well, what about Islam? Oh, no, not Islam. No, 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 no. Islam is the same everywhere. <laughs> it's never changed. It's monolithic and static. You know, it's just, it's absurd the way that we think. Um, and it's important to understand that 
Islam, be beyond just its cultural diversity, has an enormous uh, diversity of, of belief, diversity of practice, a diversity of perspectives. And to the point where, in the same way that you couldn't say with a straight face, Christianity is blank, you can't say that with Islam either. That it, it is in a constant state of evolution. It's constantly adapting itself to the needs of every particular Muslim community around the world, um, and that it will continue to do so. Why do you think that we have a tendency towards monolithic interpretations of religions. And you, know, you, can, you can go off on a lot of tangents yeah. with that, but, um, but I'm interested to know, why do you think as people we tend to do that? Well, because um, earlier I said religion is about identity. Religion is about collective identity. That's what it's really about. It's about us and them. It's about tribalism, it's about um, who is one of me and who is not. And I think that it fosters that kind of um, uh, sentiment in, in people, uh, an otherization, if you will. Um, you know, I was in Egypt uh, uh, many, many years ago, and I said something about um, uh, America to a cab driver or something, and he's like, so there, you know, America, it's a lot of Christians in America, huh? And I said, yes, a, a lot of Christians. And he said, what is the deal? Why do, why do, the, why do Americans worship the Pope? I don't, like, what, why, <laughs> what is that? And I was like, wow, there's so many layers there of wrongness. I don't know where to, I don't know where to begin. Uh, Egypt is a country in which 10% of the population is Christian and 90% of the population is Muslim. America is a country in which 70% of the, of the country is Christian and 1% is Muslim. You could be born, live a very long, happy life, and die in America and never, ever set eyes on a Muslim. There are 350 million of us, three and a half million of us are Muslim. So it, it's very, obvious why one would think of Islam as a kind of other religion. You know, when confronted, for instance, with um, extreme versions of Christianity, um, extreme versions of Christianity that promote bigotry or, or violence or intolerance, it's very easy for Americans to say, well, that's not the Christianity I know. Whether you are a Christian or not, well, that's not, that's not normative Christianity. How do you know? Because my neighbor is Christian. <laughs> because my, my grocer is Christian. And so I know, I know that that's not representative of it. But if 1% of the population is Muslim, then you have nothing to compare it to. So when you see extreme forms of Islam, you can't say, well, that's not really Islam. How do you know? Well, I don't. I don't know any Muslims, so maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe it is. I have nothing to compare it to. I think that's, that's part of it. And then the other part of it is, again, this sort of uh, the tribalism that is so endemic to religion, right? Uh, the, the old adage that my religion is a religion and your religion is a cult, right? That, that idea, that, that notion, like, you know, uh, my, my religion you get this all the time when people are like, um, you know, there are, there are verses in the, in the Quran that, that uh, promote violence. And I'll say, yeah, but there are boy verses in the Bible that promote violence. Yeah, but those, we don't have to listen to those. Those don't really count. But yours do. Yours do count. You're different. See, right. yours is different. Yours is unique. Yours is not like the others. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty standard application that all people of religion apply to other religions. Hmm. So we're talking about a reformation that's happening right now. And so I think within this, and I want to make sure that I get your, your quote right on this here, um, you have defined religious reformations, regardless of what they are, whether they take place Judaism, Christianity, right. Islam. You've defined it as a struggle between institutions and individuals over religious authority. That's right. 
So explain to us how this struggle is taking place right now, currently within Islam. Paint a picture for us. Well, let me unpack that for a minute. Yeah, yeah. Because I think, especially in America, when we hear the word reformation, we have this sort of uh, skewed view of what that means, right? right. We, we think of it, because immediately we think of the, well, what we uh, erroneously refer to as the Protestant Reformation, right? right? right. Because in our, in our impression of it, the Reformation was really just this kind of battle between uh, Protestant reform and, and Catholic intransigence, and the Protestants won. <laughs> you know? Um, and that's such a weird and skewed way of thinking about, first of all, what happened in the Christian Reformation, but just what Reformation means in general. The Christian Reformation was about who has the authority to define Christianity. Mm -hmm. Is it the institution, the papal institution, which at that point had essentially maintained an absolute iron grip over the meaning and message of Christianity for a number of reasons. Most importantly, because they were the only ones with access to the scripture that no one else could access the scripture. No one else literally could read the Bible. It was untranslated. It was unavailable. There was no printing press. Um, the only person that you would have ever met in your life who had any access, who even owned the Bible, was your priest. And so if your priest told you, the Bible says X, Y, and Z, well, that's what it says. Because what do you, I mean, there's no, there's no checking him, right? Mm -hmm. And if the Pope says, I am the only one who can say what this religion is, and if you disagree with me, then you're just not in the group anymore, um, that authority structure, you can understand, can't last once information starts to be disseminated once scripture is available to uh, other people, once it's translated into German so that you can read it on your own now. Now you don't have to read the Latin any longer. Um, at that point, then everyone suddenly becomes their own source of authority. And you don't have to necessarily rely on the institutional authority any longer. That conflict between individuals and institutions over who gets to define the faith resulted in what we now know the, uh, as the Christian Reformation, but that is a universal phenomenon. You brought up the Jewish uh, Reformation. Mm -hmm. This is what happened in the first century. It's funny because from the Christian perspective, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the living God on, on earth. From the Jewish perspective, Jesus is the Martin Luther <laughs> you know, of Judaism in a way. Um, he is one of a handful of individuals who long before the destruction of the temple um, were promoting a text-based Judaism instead of a temple-based Judaism. Same thing. Judaism was in the grip of the temple priests, the priestly authorities who had sole discretion over who could and could not be a member of this uh, community. They had sole discretion over who could or could not enter the temple, and the temple was literally the sole source of God on earth. Um, yet there were a group of uh, radical, learned Jews whose argument was that the temple is not where Judaism rests, the scripture is where it rests. Now, they got a, a little bit of a boost, because in the year 70, the temple was destroyed. And so there was no longer any temple. And after that point, the only Judaism that existed was rabbinical Judaism. Um, but again, what is, what is happening there? Institutions and individuals dis, de, de, conflicting with themselves over who can define the faith. So when we talk of the Islamic Reformation, please understand that we're not making a value judgment that there was something wrong with Islam and now it's going to be better. There is no value in a reformation. It just is. It's not positive or negative. It's an inevitable process whereby uh, religious authority begins to uh, disseminate from the traditional institutions which hold on to it to individuals on the ground. Now, in the case of Islam, there isn't a pope, a singular authority. Um, authority instead rests in, in the hands of uh, about half a dozen 
um, schools of law, um, institutional schools of law that um, because of their, how long they've been around and because of the consensus that has formed around them uh, have essentially become you know, the equivalent of let's say six popes, that's the best way to, to, to put it. Um, <laughs> or six papacies, that's a, that's a better way of putting it. Uh, six Vatican's. Um, but nevertheless, the same thing applies. These institutions, these individuals, the ulama, the learned ones, were the only ones who had access to the scripture, the only ones who could read the scripture. Um, and so as a result, they're the only ones who could interpret what the scripture meant. And so for most, most Muslims for the last 1400 years, they really had no uh, uh, other alternative except to go to their alam, their, their learned one, and to uh, receive the knowledge secondhand from them. In the last 50 years, the Quran has been translated into more languages than in the previous 1500 years combined. Um, rapid, rapid advances in uh, education in large parts of the Muslim world, in literacy in large parts of the Muslim world, have given individuals access to the scripture in a way that would have been unheard of in the previous century, um, in the previous centuries. And as a result, what's happened is what always happens in these cases. Individuals have begun to set themselves up as their own authority structures, and they've begun to push back against the traditional authorities. I also want to say very quickly that this is not necessarily a smooth process. Okay? <laughs> uh, the Christian Reformation resulted in the death of half the population of Germany alone. Uh, and by the way, this notion of sola scriptura, this idea that the scripture alone should be the source of authority and anyone should be able to go to it and interpret for themselves what the scripture means, as you already know, opens up a whole can of worms. <laughs> because that means now anyone, anyone is their own source of authority. And if that person has you know, a, an outlet or an audience, um, a, a, a way of, of making their voice heard, then they can essentially start their own movements. I mean, Christianity fractured into hundreds of sects and schisms as a result of the Christian Reformation. And the same thing is happening within Islam now. You have a multiplicity of voices, a multiplicity of authorities, no longer six, now 6,000. And each one of them says, this is the correct interpretation. And so the conflicts that we are seeing in large parts of the Muslim world are a direct result of the Reformation. They're not proof that Islam needs a Reformation. They are the Reformation. That's what you are witnessing is the Reformation. It's a chaotic, catastrophic, bloody event. Interesting. So Right now, and I, oh yeah, you I'm go, sorry, go ahead, please. I'm say no, one more continue thing. I on. Just keep going. Yes. And by the way, it's very difficult to know who the the villains and heroes uh, mm -hmm. will be of this story. We lionize Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a genocidal maniac. Um, Martin Luther didn't say that anyone should be able to read the scriptures and interpret it for themselves. He said he should be able to read the scriptures and interpret for themselves. When Thomas Munster, his fellow Reformation uh, uh, leader, said that's a great idea and began what will eventually became known as um, the, uh, um, uh, well, it's sometimes referred to as the Radical Reformation or whatever. Um, uh, Martin Luther's response was Munster and all of his followers should be killed and their houses should be burned to the ground. So, you know, so I've, I've argued in the past that 500 years from now, we may look back and think of Osama bin Laden as one of the titans of the Islamic Reformation. Because this is a man who, whose entire message 
was predicated on stop going to mosque, stop talking to your imam, stop listening to the learned men. They have nothing to teach you. All you need is the Quran and nothing more. And you can read that and it'll tell you what to do. Now, I'm the one telling you what to do. I'm telling you what it says. But his argument was an argument of sola scriptura that sounded very, very much like the argument that Martin Luther was making 500 years ago. Wow. Well, yeah, so, there you go. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, one of the, we're right now, Christianity is in the middle of a reformation uh, at this point in time, and we're reacting to predominantly modernity and science, which has slowly kind of eroded away at many of the principles that Christians have held dear for a long time. I preach about that in this church a lot, trying to say, you know, this, is, this tidal wave has been coming for a long time, and now we are trying to work our way through um, what it's going to look like. And it, it's, it, you know, you can literally see in some congregations, it's just eroding away, you know, every year. There's just less and less people because the younger generation, they have grown up with a skeptical, scientific yep. perspective. And um, I wonder, is that something that is, that is also impacting, I would assume it is, but how is it impacting uh, Islam as far as you can see? I mean, the, the youth bulge in uh, traditionally Muslim majority countries is unfathomable. I mean, if you look at what we now refer to as the modern Middle East, which is North Africa, um, Middle East, and then parts of Central Asia, and of course, um, South, South Asia. Um, Manasseh, it's sometimes referred to. Middle East, North Africa, South Asia, Manasseh. In Manasseh, 75% of the population is under 35. 50% is under 25. Wow. Um, it's, a, it's a youth bulge that, uh, when combined with all these other things that I was talking about, this is a, a youth bulge that is educated, is literate, is globalized, it's plugged in, you know, they, they, they're on the internet, they're in social media, they know what's happening around the world, they have access to new and novel theories, sources of information. Um, they, they just simply do not accept the kind of traditional Islamic authorities any longer. Um, and they certainly don't do so as their sort of sole source of information or interpretation. Um, you know, they're much more likely they're much less like, look, look, 30 years ago, if you were a Muslim living in Malaysia and you had a question about some aspect of Islam in your life, you know, some, you had a question about marriage or about whatever the case may be, your only option was to go to the mosque, uh, talk to your imam, tell him your problem, and then he, because he's the only one who has access, uh, would tell you, uh, the answer. This is, this is what you're, you should do, and then you go off and, and do it. Today, that Malaysian has at least five or six different uh, online fatwa databases that he could just simply go to. He could just simply you know, search in these databases his question and get the views of 40 different imams from all over the world. And then, because this is how Islam works, that no, no cleric has authority to, um, uh, no, no cleric has authority over another cleric, right? So it's like, it's like rabbinical Judaism, right? One rabbi is, has as much authority as another rabbi. It's not like they don't, one kind of over, overcomes the other one. There's no hierarchy. Um, this, this kid can just simply pick which, which idea he likes the best. That's the one. I like that answer much more than these other 29 answers. That's just now we're sort of understanding the consequences of that. That's going to absolutely alter the face of Islam in the, the coming century. I think with Christianity, what we're seeing is, yes, two things. Number one, um, the, what happens you know, every generation in which um, Christian doctrine has to figure out a way to uh, uh, make peace with our 
rapidly changing understanding of the universe and, and reality. To me, there's a much more interesting phenomenon taking place in American Christianity, particularly in Protestant evangelical Christianity, and that is um, the politicization of it. Um, the shorthand for this, of course, is what's been happening with the Trump, Trump evangelicals. Um, and there have been numerous really fantastic uh, uh, papers and articles and books that have been written about this. I've talked about this ad nauseum, um, about the way that Trump, uh, you know, he broke evangelical Christianity. He breaks everything he touches, but, um, you know, but he's really, you know, he broke, he broke American evangelicalism because he's created this crisis within the single largest um, body of Christians in the United States um, over whether, you know, the, the, the sort of this kind of unblinkered support of a, how can I put this, a racist, sexist, lecherous, pathologically lying, narcissistic sociopath um, uh, Tell us how you really feel. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, try, I'm trying to think, that was like the most polite way that I could put it. I was like, how can I, how can I put it politely? That's about as politely as I could put it. Whether this, this unblinkered support for him from his evangelical base is a betrayal of what evangelical Christianity was supposed to mean. Um, that to me is the real fascinating uh, evolution of American Christianity that, that I think is, is going to have some very interesting consequences in the next decade or so. So yeah, so bringing it up, looking into the future, um, when we're talking about, I guess religion and particularly Islam, you know, what are your hopes 30, 50 years down the line when we're talking about the various adherents to the, to the different traditions of Islam? What do you right. hope for them? And then I'm also interested in, in what your hopes are for Islam as a geopolitical force in the world, which mm -hmm. it is. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a huge force. Um, that's, that's super interesting. Um, well, look, as I said earlier, I mean, all religions are constantly in the state of evolution. Islam 30, 50 years from now will not look like Islam today. Globally, one, one thing that's really fascinating is what we're seeing is um, that Christianity, global Christianity, is in the process of moving eastward and southward uh, in the world, whereas global Islam is in the process of moving northward and westward. And it'll, it'll be you know, a good century before these sort of religions really rebalance uh, the globe as far as population centers go. Um, and that's an idea that, that people are already starting to to chew on now to figure out what that's going to mean a hundred years from now when we stop referring to, you know, when, when we can say that Christianity is an Eastern religion. Like that's a weird thing to say, that the, the majority of Christians are gonna be in Asia. Wow. You know, that's, that's a strange phenomenon to think about, right? Because that's not how we think about it. And the majority of Muslims will be in sort of Europe and in, in the West. Um, so, that to me, I think, is going to be really fascinating. And what that, how that's going to affect Islam is I think it's going to accelerate this reformation process. Like the truth of the matter is that Islam is fundamentally a communal religion. That's, it arose out of a communal society. It's all about community. Your salvation rests in the ummah, in the community itself. It's the source of salvation. And yet, it's undergoing this radical individual, individual, individualization. That's the word I'm looking for. It's undergoing this rapid individualization um, for all the, the reasons that we had talked about before. And I think that the more it moves westward and northward, the more the geography of Islam changes, the more individualistic it's going to become. The more we're going to see um, greater sectarianism in Islam, greater, uh, is that me? It's not just me, right? Is that me? <laughs> Ready? Ready? No? Okay. Uh, greater sectarianism, greater schisms, um, 
greater micro communities. And then I'll just add one more, one more factor to this because I think it's fascinating not just for Islam but for, for religion in general is that um, you know, the, the, the internet and social media has transformed the definition of community. We have to understand that from the dawn of humanity to about 30 years ago, the definition of community was the people around you. That's what it meant. It was a geographic thing, whether that meant the people in your cave, or the people in your village, or the people in your city, or the people in your nation. Community is geographically defined and always has been. Now, religion has always been a transnational force. It's always tried to break through borders and boundaries. But nevertheless, even so, I mean, I'm sure that, that you guys have an enormous connection to the larger Presbyterian community in the United States, but nevertheless, there's still the sort of the microness of it, right? Like this is our community here. What the internet has done is completely change what community means. It's no longer geographically bound. Um, and so, you know, if you are that Malaysian kid, that Mal Muslim Malaysian kid, um, you may have more in common with, you know, a, a, a Muslim in kid in Chicago because you both like Game of Thrones and you both, you know, uh, you know, like the same kind of music than either of you have with your community. And so the building blocks of creating these new communities, these virtual communities, is already there, it's already happening. So that's just going to continue to accelerate the fracturing of the Muslim world into these more and more smaller, more rarefied schisms and sects. Um, just in many ways the way that Christianity did after the, the Christian Reformation. Hmm. So, do you feel like you've gotten... I feel like I've got, got, got it. Pretty much everything I want to say. Okay, okay good. <laughs> all right. So, I think that we do want to open it up for you all at this point. So, if you have questions, um, again, we would ask that you uh, come up uh, to the center here. Uh, you can ask your question and... We'll see where we go. Don't everybody jump up at once. <laughs> Hi. Hello. My name is Machine, and I wanted to thank you for coming tonight and for your words about Islamic uh, Reformation and religion. As a Muslim person in today's society and with Reformation, what do you see as the average Muslim living here and as their search of their identity in this country with Reformation? How do you perceive the average Muslim, their take on current political environment, how you want to raise your children, how you want to assimilate, especially since you've come from an era after the Iranian Revolution where mm -hmm. your assimilation was pretty much the opposite. Yeah. You mean here in America? Yes. Yeah. Well, so I, I kind of train myself never to say things about the average anyone, and certainly not the average Muslim, because there's no such thing. Uh, a Muslim, as I never get tired of saying, is whoever says he or she is a Muslim. Full stop. Full stop. A Muslim is whoever says they're a Muslim. That's it. There's nothing, there's nothing after that sentence. Um, and so you could be, you know, a secular Muslim or a moderate Muslim or a, you know, there's all these terms that we throw around because what they do is they provide a way of identifying ourselves against someone else. Like I'm moderate and you're extremist. Um, so I, 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 I try to avoid those terms altogether. Insofar as the question of assimilation though, I think that's a really, really good question. Um, particularly because the rhetoric that one hears from the far right, uh, the Fox News community, right, is that well, the problem with Muslim immigration is that unlike every other group of immigrants who came to the United States, Muslims don't assimilate. They don't integrate into American society. That's why we need a Muslim ban, because their values are not our values. They're not, they're not true Americans. 
Um, the absurdity of that statement, I think, is just obvious on its face, right? I mean, the same people who say that, their, their ancestors said it about the Irish. They said it about the Italians. Then they said it about the Germans. They said it about you know Mexicans. They said it just every community they say that. Oh, these the other immigrants were okay, but this new group of immigrants they're the real problem because they won't assimilate. Um, it's just it's false and it's absurd. Um, Muslims, as I said earlier, represent about one percent of of the uh, the population of the United States. So just about the whole you know, impending Muslim takeover <laughs> conversations. We should probably tamp those down until we get to 2%. <laughs> when we get to 2%, watch out, watch out. At 1%, you know. Um, uh, they make up about 1% of, of the population, but 60% of that 1% is uh, immigrants, immigrant, first generation immigrants like myself. That's an astonishing number. Now understand, Muslims have been in America since before there was any such thing called America. They were brought here on slave ships. Um, so Muslims have been here from the very, very beginning. But it is true that over the last few decades, there has been this massive influx of Muslims, particularly from the Manasseh region, Middle East, North Africa, South Asia. And so the constant conversations that we have about whether Muslims can integrate in America is basically the same conversations that we have all the time about uh, immigrants uh, in, in the United States. Muslims as a immigrant population represent the single highest levels of literacy and education of any immigrant population in the United States the highest levels of education, but also um, the highest levels of income. In fact, the uh, median uh, income for a Muslim household in America uh, dwarfs that of a non-Muslim household. In fact, the advertising giant JWT uh, just about four or five years ago released this big report because they were telling advertisers, you need to start selling to Muslims in America. Um, they, they calculated that the annual combined income of American Muslims is $120 billion. Um, and if that number sounds ridiculous, come to the Silicon Valley and look at the board of advisors uh, at Google or at Yahoo or at Apple and just see how many Mahmouds and Mohammeds and Ali's and Hassan's there are on those lists. Um, look, I, I think that Muslims are having the experience, particularly Muslims from immigrant uh, communities, are having the same experience in America that every immigrant community has had here. Uh, demonization, otherization, uh, uh, fear and, and anxiety, uh, the questions about you know their their what they're truly up to and what their you know what their motives are in coming here the fact that they cannot be Americans everything that is being said about uh, about Muslims in America today was said about Jews into in the interwar period was said about Catholics at the beginning of the 19th century you know we had an actual political party the know nothings they called themselves an actual political party predicated almost wholly on a platform of anti-Catholic Catholic immigration. They actually ran someone for president and almost won um, because their argument was that you can't be both Catholic and American. You just can't. You can't have loyalty both to the Pope and the president. You can't uh, obey the Vatican and Washington. What if the Pope tells you to rise up against America? You have to listen to the Pope. And so you can't be American if you're Catholic. We said the same things about Jews uh, in, in the 30s and 40s, right? That the, that the whole idea, some of our greatest icons, right? Charles Lindbergh and, and uh, uh, Henry Ford, you know, these were the most pitiless anti-Semites you could imagine. Henry Ford actually published the Protocols of the Elders of Zion 
in all of his national newspapers and then forced his dealerships around the country to sell them. Uh, you know, Charles Lindbergh said that the Holocaust was a Jewish conspiracy in order to drag America into a war in Europe. What we hear about Muslims today, we've heard about every new community of Americans. And the people who say those words today are going to land in the exact same garbage heap of history as everyone who has said those words about every other community in America. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fiaz Ahmed. I'm one of the members of the local community here. Uh, thanks for the great overview of the uh, state of current state of Islam. Uh, I have a question about reformation versus renovations. There's a contention among many Muslim scholars in the West who say that the abode of Islam is sound and it has fallen in disrepair and it has been dilapidated from dilapidators from within and from without. Yeah. So the, my question to you is, as you've mentioned, the reformation in Christianity has led to a lot of bloodshed and problems. Would you agree that we need a renovation and not a reformation? Hmm. That's a really nice way of saying that. Um, you know, the, the, the quote unquote problem with the Ummah is something that we've been hearing since the death of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, I said earlier that salvation in Islam rests in the community. I want to zero in and explain to you exactly what that means. In the same way that you know, uh, Catholicism would say salvation rests in the church, and Protestants would say salvation rests in Jesus, Muslims would say your salvation rests in your membership within the Ummah, the worldwide body of faith. The Ummah is the church in, in Islam. The concept was developed originally by the Prophet Muhammad when there were 70 Muslims. There are now 1.7 billion Muslims. And so there is really no such thing as the Ummah any longer. Um, it's become a kind of utopian fantasy in a way. When you hear you know, uh, some of these jihadist ideologues, what you hear all the time, and when they talk about the recreation of the caliphate, that's what they mean. It's this idea that the Ummah has been uh, somehow corrupted and fragmented, and we have to recreate the Ummah, and the caliph becomes the, the sort of uh, physical embodiment of that, of that fantasy, of that dream. Um, and I get that. I understand the longing for the way things used to be. Um, but it's just not realistic. There will ne it will never be the way that things used to be. That will never happen. And there's no reason to actually want it to happen. I find often that those people who are most vocal in saying that, um, you know, the community is, is uh, on the wrong path, that, you know, it's, uh, it, it has to be rejuvenated from within, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're the ones who tend to mean that it should be rejuvenated around them, right? What I mean by that is that everyone should follow me and do it the way that I'm doing it. And I get that. That's a natural impulse that human beings have, particularly religious human beings. Um, but I just don't see any value for it. A Muslim is whoever they says he or she is a Muslim. A Christian is whoever says he or she is a Christian. A Jew is whoever says he or she is a Jew. And nobody else gets to define that for you. Nobody else gets to tell you whether you're a Muslim or not. That doesn't happen. That's not how it works. You get to say whether you're a Muslim or not. And if that means that there's all kinds of tears and fractures and rips and schisms and, and, and a thousand different ways of believing this, so be it. 
Thanks again for coming, Dr. Aslan. I had a quick question. Um, what are some other authors and scholars that you like to read uh, as you're an author yourself? I would just be interested in who else like you look at for inspiration as well. Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, scholars of, of religion, um, it depends. You know, um, when it comes to Islam, uh, I, you know, I was kind of taught by some of the old school guys. Um, and I prefer, because I myself am a Sufi, I prefer um, the Sufi scholarship of people like Anne-Marie Schimmel and Idris Shah and uh, Karl Ernst. Um, and then when it comes to Christianity, um, you know, there's, it really runs the gambit for me. Like there are a lot of very conservative um, Christian uh, thinkers uh, whose perspectives I, I disagree with, but whose methodology I, I really enjoy. And I name a bunch of them in, in, the, in the back of Zealot, so I don't, I don't want to get too involved in it. Um, I, I first came to religion um, through like Joseph Campbell and Houston Smith, you know, those guys who, who were sort of the old fashioned comparative religion people who, who their, their primary goal was to say, isn't it weird how all these different religions throughout time and space have so many things in common with each other? Shouldn't someone pay attention to that? Um, and that ultimately became uh, the discipline called the history of religions. Those are the people who, who really motivated me to do what I do now. Yeah, uh, Professor Aslan, um, um, I have to preface my question by telling you, like, I'm like your father, I'm a proud atheist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing is, what I, what I was in that, giving that as a pretext for, for my question is, I had a um, professor, medieval historian, when I was an undergraduate, in, in Toronto, who now, he was a medieval historian, he, he now teaches in the, in, at Trinity College at the University of Toronto in the Divinity School there, and he once made the observation about the great religious texts. He said, um, it's whether the narrative is true. Would you, would you agree with that statement, or would you, in what way would you agree with that, in what way would you disagree with that statement? I, I, this is a, as a, I'm asking this. As, in, no, it's such a good question. I in, love this question. In, 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 I'm asking you this obviously as your as a general scholar of religion rather than you know. So if you could, you know. No, it's a great. In fact, we were we were kind of talking about this um, uh, upstairs just a, a little while ago about the difference between history and sacred history, yeah. and the understanding that scripture is about sacred history, not about history that what we refer to as history, which is the objective accumulation of data, um, and then the interpretation of that data, did not exist when the Quran or the Hebrew scriptures or the New Testament were written. That that notion of history would have been completely foreign to the authors of our scriptures. For yeah. them, yeah. it wasn't facts that were their main concern, it was truth. And right. while we in the modern world, of course, as you know, children of the scientific revolution, have been told that truth is fact, fact is truth, that the definition of truth is that which can be factually verified, that's a new concept, that's a very new idea. In the ancient mind, truth and fact were two separate things. Right. They had two totally different functions. Right. And so we now read these ancient scriptures through this modern lens, and it's precisely why it causes so many problems for us. Yeah. Uh, not just religious and cultural problems, but even problems of interpretation. Um, the, the ancient mind, the people who were responsible for the scriptures, what they were trying to do was use narratives to reveal certain truths. And the way that they did so was by putting this, those truths in the form of a story. This is a, a very important point for all scriptures, but I think it's, it's especially important when it comes to understanding the Gospels, because we read the Gospels like they're biographies, you know, written firsthand accounts by disciples who walked around with like a pen and paper. And then every time Jesus did something, they're like, get that down. Did you get that? <laughs> Write that down. That was good. First of all, 
all of Jesus' disciples were illiterate. Very much, very likely, Jesus himself was illiterate. Scholars believe that anywhere between 80 and 90 percent of Jews in first century Palestine were illiterate. The only Jews who could read and write in ancient Palestine were the rabbis and the priests. And Jesus wasn't a rabbi or a priest. He was a day laborer. So that's an important point to keep in mind. But it is also important to understand that this is not to deny the divine quality of the scripture. You know, people ask me all the time, like, is, do you believe that the Quran is divinely inspired? Yes, I believe that the Quran is divinely inspired. I also believe Abbey Road is divinely inspired. <laughs> okay, I don't, I mean, I, you know, the God that I believe in didn't speak only once, first of all. And secondly, to me, divine inspiration is about the intimate connection that happens between creator and creation, and the results that come out of that intimate connection. But to think that divinely inspired means that every single word of scripture is inerrant and literal is absurd, frankly, in my, in my point of view. That's the wrong way to read scripture. It's not how it was written. It's not how it was meant to be read. Well, but, does ask a corollary to that question? Sure, uh, qu oh, okay. Quickly. Well, okay. What what narratives do you do you read? Do you find you know what what narrative? What what, what what? Well, so this is a perfect example. Look, when I when I read the Gospels, no, I get. No, I don't mean I don't mean the the great texts. I mean you know other texts that you what that you have think have narrative truth. Um. I mean all kinds, honestly. Like it, it's really. I, I mean for me, I, I find the expression of truth. Um, in the written form, in uh, artistic expressions and musical expressions. Um, I mean, you know, yeah. ones that come out to you, you know, like, like right off, you, you, you come out, right, just, you know, if you had to, you know, choose two or three books that you would say. I guess I'm too, my mind is still in scriptural form because I'm, I'm thinking, like, right now, my, my, my sons and I are reading the Ramayana a lot. And, yeah. and that's, a, that's a text that has some really, really profound truth in it. And, I, and I, it's something I definitely recommend for people, especially if you, have, if you have boys. I mean, it's about a blue god who fights demons with a magic bow and arrow. Like, that's the greatest boy's story ever. <laughs> thank anyway, you, sir. Thank you. Now, I have another question, but I don't want to no, That's okay. <laughs> yeah, my name is Anders Benson, and I'm curious if you, see this word, uh, is it Uma or community? Uma, yeah. Uma. If you see that word in an Abrahamic sense, and um, I'm coming to this as uh, an immigrant kid, and about eight years ago I had a day that I thought would be like changing, life changing for me. There was a Christianist terrorist named Anders Breivik who murdered about 70 people, and I thought... 67 I of them children. Exactly, and I thought Today, I have just become the Osama of Christianity mm, with yeah. that name, Anders B. Anders. And mm. nobody has ever said anything about that to me. Nobody's ever made that connection. So somehow, a Christian gets, I don't know, uh, yeah. go back. Well, he didn't even just do it. He did it in the name of Christ, he said. Yes. Um, by the way, the, there's a, uh, a movie coming out about it. Uh, yes. So finally, maybe people will pay more attention to it. I think the reason that people didn't pay attention to it is because, again, they, they just saw, they compared it to normative Christianity. And they said, oh, well, this guy just slaughtered nearly 70 children in the name of Christ. And like, well, but that's not true, because that's not what Christians do. How do I know that? I know Christians. So I can just ignore it. Um, I, I, I think, I think um, uh, the, the, er wait, the earlier part of your question, Wait, yeah, about something. about the Uma. Yeah, that's right, the Uma. Yes. And Abraham. And right. What can exactly. We do to find our community amongst. So just to put my scholar hat Jewish. on for a minute, mm -hmm. um, the the consensus of scholars of early Islam is that when the Prophet Muhammad created this concept, the Uma, and by the way, when I say he created, he really did create it. We still don't actually know what the word means. Um, we're not sure. There's all kinds of ideas about where he, where the word came from. 
people think, well, maybe it's, it comes from the, the, the word mother somehow. Um, but it was a sort of a, a, a wholly new concept that the Prophet Muhammad um, created, in which he said, the ummah is, is the, the community of faith. It is the near unanimous consensus of scholars that when he created that concept, he did so in the city of Medina, that concept included Jews and Christians. That when he said Ummah, he meant the followers of Abraham. That's what he meant. Now remember, at this time, there was no such word as Islam. There was no such word as Muslim. In fact, the evidence indicates that no one called him or herself a Muslim until long after the Prophet had died. Um, they called themselves uh, a whole host of different things, companions, things like that. Uh, but the, the term Islam as a distinct identity marker uh, for this one particular community did not exist during the Prophet's lifetime. And so when he used the word Ummah, he meant the followers of Abraham. That's what he meant. Um, it was only much later, again, this is a perfectly natural thing for religions to do as they grow and evolve and expand and become much larger. It was much, much later that um, the Ummah, in an attempt to more stringently define itself, excluded Jews and Christians from that term and said, no, 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 Ummah means something distinct from these other uh, Abrahamic religions and the idea of Islam and the term Islam arose out of that. So yes, unquestionably, Ummah originally meant the followers of Abraham. Thank you. Hi Reza, my name is Derek Klopfenstein. Um, I like your books and your YouTube videos. Uh, my question is, is there an Islamic school of thought or madhab that takes the scripture as a created word instead of the ultimate uncreated word? Wow, that's a really, really good question. So the, 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 um, what, what, he's, what Derek is bringing up is this fundamental split that took place around the 9th, 10th century or so um, between whether the Quran is created or uncreated. So let me back up a little bit because it's super fascinating, but I need to give you a little bit of uh, background to this. So the Quran is not like a lot of other texts, a lot of other scriptures, right? Uh, it's not a collection of books uh, written by dozens of different hands over hundreds of different years, the way the Hebrew scriptures are. Um, it's not you know, a, a, a bunch of letters written by believers about you know, the, the prophet, um, the way that so much of the New Testament is. The Quran is what's often referred to as direct revelation, right? It's one person receiving a sustained message from the divine and then revealing that message over the course of two decades, re revealing that message and then that message being written down by others. Um, and so the Quran can be baffling for the uninitiated. I mean, I think a lot of like really well-meaning non-Muslims will be like, you know what, I'm gonna like read the Quran and, and dispel all these myths. And then they go to Barnes and Noble and they buy the Quran and they open up to the first page because that's what you do with the Bible. And then after about four lines, you're like, what is happening? I don't <laughs> understand any of this. Is there any chapters? What is this? Um, that's on purpose. The Quran, when it was compiled, was deliberately compiled without an editorial hand. Yes, it is divided in chapters, but those chapters make no sense. There's no internal um, uh, 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 sort of organization to the chapters. They have titles, but the titles are usually a riff on whatever the first few verses were. Um, they're, they're, they're put together according to, from the longest chapter to the shortest chapter. Um, there's, the, there's no thematic element. It's not like this is, this is the part of the Quran where it, it's just about this and now this part is about this. It's just all over the place and on purpose. Muslims do not read the Quran 
the way that, say, Christians read the New Testament. The majority of Muslims, that when they read the Quran, they just sort of flip it open at any point and just start reading. Um, and because that's how it's supposed to be. It's direct revelation from God. Okay. As a result of this, this huge theological argument started within Islam, which is, now hold on, if this is the word of God, and the foundational belief of Islam is that God is indivisible, that's why he can never have a son, for instance, that God is divine unity, he is indivisible, then how can his word be separate from his self? If it's his speech, then it has to be his self. There can't be a division between God's self and God's speech. They must be the one and the same thing. That, by the way, is why uh, Muslims treat the Quran um, the same way that Jews treat, treat um, the Hebrew scriptures, right? That the, the words themselves are divine. I mean, literally, the, the actual letters on the page printed themselves have divine power over and above what the words mean. Um, so that's why you have to be careful how you handle it, etc., etc. So this argument arose about is the Quran uncreated and eternal, the way God is uncreated and eternal, or is it a created thing? Was there a time in which the Quran didn't exist and then the Quran did exist? This argument was you know, back and forth for the first five, six, seven centuries of Islam, and then for some very, very complicated political reasons that I do not want to get into. I'll just, there was a very powerful, famous caliph by the name of Al-Mamun, who was a uh, progressive rationalist who believed that the Quran uh, was created and that it should be open to interpretation, and he believed that so much that he slaughtered anyone who disagreed, um, <laughs> as one does. Um, uh, when, when that caliph died, the backlash to his forced progressivism was so great that the other side took over, um, the traditionalists, the so-called uncreated uh, uh, Quranists. And that, to this day, tends to be the dominant position in all the Islamic schools of law. That the Quran is uncreated, it is God. It's not the word of God, it is God. And as a result, it's inerrant, it's unchangeable, it's untranslatable. If you translate the Quran, then it's not the Quran any longer. You could understand why that would lead to an enormous amount of problems Partly what we've been talking about, you know, this this whole time. So it's still that's now the dominant view. There, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to do these last two questions, and then sound good? Yeah. All right. Why don't we take them both, and then I'll just. Sure. You yeah. can do so. Lane, ask your question, and then we'll and then and then we'll get the other question too. Oh, okay. So um, I'm Lane Krim. Very nervous and speaking in front of people. <laughs> so. Um, as a queer, non-binary, trans guy, gender non-conforming, um, I don't like gendered things. Uh -huh. So, but, okay, so like, you know, I just was wondering your thoughts on the, just the HUD job within the current, I don't know if there's as much as a gender revolution going on other places, not in like America or, or I don't know. Anyway, but my, like I understand it, I become more comfortable with it when someone said like it's supposed to symbolize, you know, you're Islamic and you will help people, mm -hmm. kind of like a cross, but I was just wondering your thought in the modern world. Great question, great question. So do you want to, so we get, yeah, I'll take, so the, I'll take yeah. the next one too. Yeah, okay, so yeah. thank you, Lane, and then let's get the last question. All right, um, my question has to do with more of harkening back to what you said about Thomas Munster and his comparison, and Martin Luther's striking down of him, and just the whole beginning of the Protestant Reformation through as the Northern Renaissance started to produce people like Erasmus and the praises of folly, which started to call into question 
the institution, the papacy, would mm -hmm. you, um, is, like, would you, is there any comparison to the President's Revolt of 1527 that caused Martin Luther to strike it down as like the inception of the Protestant Reformation, the whole political aspect of it, because his reliance on the German princes, and was there like a, there's a, like the build up to the whole is Islamic Reformation, and what would you say like the internet has fractured a, one leadership of it, allowing more people to have more information as information becomes more widespread. Fa fabulous question. Thank you so much. Um, uh, okay, let, so the, the first question was primarily about the hijab. Um, look, I get that question a lot. It, here's, here's my sort of pat answer to it, which is that uh, I don't wear a hijab, so I don't get an opinion. <laughs> That's it. Uh, what I will say to expand on that a little bit, as a, as a scholar and a historian, I can talk about how the hijab arose, why it arose, the fact that there's actually no, no commandment anywhere, anywhere in the Quran that demands that women wear a hijab. There are commandments uh, in, in the Quran about modest dress for both men and women. The hijab um, was originally, there's evidence to, historical evidence to show that um, during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, no one but the Prophet's wives wore the hijabs. In fact, the term, the, the, the Arabic term, darabat al-hijab, putting on the hijab, was synonymous with becoming Muhammad's wife. Um, and that had to do with a whole host of sort of political issues. The hijab arose uh, two, three hundred years before Islam. It was primarily a, uh, a practice that very wealthy Iranian and Syrian women uh, would do, um, and just in general, hijab, which just means curtain, it means curtained off, it means sort of separating from society, it's something that wealthy women wore because it was an indication that they didn't have to work. They didn't have to work in the fields, they didn't have to um, you know, do menial labor. And then after the death of the prophet, it rapidly became a thing that Muslim women did to emulate the wives of the prophet. Um, and then, because religions are invented by men, uh, it very quickly then became uh, a, a means uh, of controlling uh, women's bodies. Um, and that's how it arose in, in uh, the, the sort of first two, three hundred years uh, of Islam, but it was still not widely used or obligatory. It really wasn't until the colonial experience that the hijab became um, more widespread and, uh, and even in some cases mandatory. And that was primarily uh, as a way of, of differentiating uh, quote unquote Islamic culture from this sort of dominant colonial culture that was trying to eradicate it, to root it out. It was a, a form of protest, if you will, by women uh, as well as by men. Today, the hijab means a million different things. Um, I think in the American imagination, the hijab somehow is the symbol of female oppression in Islam. I, I am not saying that there aren't large parts of, of the Muslim world in which women are, are treated in appalling ways and that they don't have the same uh, rights and privileges as men do, that's true. There is a problem. The hijab is not the problem. Uh, the hijab means whatever anybody wants it to mean. And so I think that we are better off not fixating on a, a piece of cloth that a woman chooses to put over her hair. And if you truly do care about the plight of Muslim women around the world, then there are things that you can do that are much more important than railing about the hijab. Um, to the question about the political aspects of Reformation, it's really, I mean, the parallels are striking um, in the same way that, yes, it's true, the princes of Europe were much more willing to um, uh, advance the cause of Protestantism because it meant separating from uh, the domination, the political domination of the papacy and not having to send enormous amount of taxes uh, to, to the pope. Um, 
the political aspect in the Islamic Reformation is very uh, much similar. What has happened in the last 60, 70, 80 years is that as many Muslim majority countries, places like Syria or Saudi Arabia or Egypt, um, have become uh, dictatorships, primarily military dictatorships, um, the first order of business is to control the mosque. And so, whereas for much of the last you know, 1,500 years, uh, the imam was uh, someone who, like in a, you know, a pastor in a, a neighborhood church, is basically, uh, uh, you know, his, his living is paid by the tithes that the church gives, right? I mean, you're an employee of this church. Um, what these military dictators learned very, very quickly is that you need to control the church, you need to control the imams. And so in large parts of the Muslim world, the imam is a state employee. So for instance, in Egypt, the state plays the imam. And so the state defines what the imam can preach and cannot preach. The same is true in, in Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, the state often writes the imam's sermons for him. And any imam who dares to uh, deviate from that script for too long isn't heard of much longer. Um, if you're a young Muslim, okay, this again, the appeal of bin Laden and jihadism, right? If you're a young Muslim and you are looking out in the world at the injustice and the suffering and, and the problems that are taking place, and you see the corruption and the nepotism and the lack of social justice in your own country, and then you go to mosque on a Friday and you sit down and you hear a government employee argue with you about how many angels can fit on the head of a pin, you can understand why that starts to lose its appeal real fast. And that if someone shows up on YouTube and says, stop going to that mosque, don't go there anymore, that man has nothing for you. He's as corrupt as the government that pays him. He doesn't know what's going on in the world. Let me tell you what's going on in the world. If you're 16, 17, 18 years old, and even remotely globally aware, that is a very appealing message. It's dangerous as all reformations can be. But at the same time, if we can get enough voices, and those voices are out there and they're loud, they're strong, who go on, who, who are on YouTube and who say, yeah, that's true. Your imam has nothing for you. But let me give you a different way of thinking about it, a vision of Islam that's pluralistic and democratic and, and feminist and Oh, and in a constant evolution, a new way of thinking about this faith that can help you solve your problems, your grievances, and the problems of the world, then it's a good thing, right? It goes right back to where we started. Reformations aren't good or bad, but they are opportunities. Thank you. <laughs> So he's going to go around, um, and he's going to be out in the narthex to sign your books. Give him a second to get there. Um, and uh, I really appreciate all of you coming out tonight. Um, he set the stage for us, I think, to do a lot of work in our community, particularly between Christians and Muslims. And so I hope that we can continue this conversation after tonight. Thank you again for being here, and have a safe drive home.